What's good, guys? It's Ilsun 4K, and thanks for joining me on this next episode of Halloween 3 Into the Unknown. And I definitely have an unknown known that you need to see after the end of this review. But for those of you that don't know and are asking, what the hell is Halloween? Halloween is a month long video we do here on my channel every October for the third year in a row now, where we review horror movies that take place on or around Halloween. But this year, we're trying something a little different. Instead of going after all the cliche movies everybody knows in this genre, such as your Halloweens, your Terror Fires, your Trick or Treats, we're doing something different and actually digging up deep unknown films that have the same exact requirements of taking place on Halloween. And this one is definitely cool. This one is a movie called Jacko, and it came out in 1995. And despite the fact it came out in 1995, it somehow has this 80s vibe to it while feeling like an adult version of Goosebumps from back in the 90s. Remember that show? Yeah, I'm not even kidding. That's exactly what it feels like. An adult version of Goosebumps, and it's just so awesome. I mean, you really need to see this just because the slasher in this alone, Jacko, is fantastic. And believe it or not, while the acting is what you'd expect so bad it's good, the storyline is actually very unique and has the whole brooding families from two generations thing going on because they never left their small town. I definitely think you should check this out, so make sure you stick around for this review. Thank you for watching, and make sure you like and subscribe to the channel for more Halloween 3 Into the Unknown reviews all month long. So, the best way to describe this plot is a little difficult to explain, but very easy to understand when you watch it. And to fully explain it would require a lot of overanalyzation and spoiling of some fun points that you just need to see for yourself. So, anyway, the film starts out with a young boy sitting around a campfire with an old man telling him a story, which is, this is the second film I'll be talking about that has that. But anyway, this young boy is part of a family known as the Kellys family. They live in Oakmore, facetious town, whatever state. We find out that there's this creepy woman around the town that all the young boys seem to think is a witch and her name is Vivian Matchin. Well, come to find out one day Vivian Matchin comes to the Kelly's house and said, Hey listen, funny story. Hundreds of years ago, one of your ancestors killed one of my ancestors, who was a powerful warlock, but before they killed him, because he was an evil guy, he summoned an evil spirit to come and kill your family, the spirit being Jacko. Your family found a way to contain this spirit inside of the ground with the crucifix that these teenagers came along and removed, and now you have a little bit of a problem on your hands, because this demon entity is coming to kill you, and specifically your son, to stop the bloodline. Well, the problem with that is this. They don't believe her because why the hell would you believe that the crazy woman in town is coming to you and saying, hey, possessed demons are coming to kill you. Sounds like something the crazy woman in the town would say. Anyway, the parents go out for a little bit on Halloween night and proceed to have their son watched by the babysitter, the lovely and beautiful Lena Quigley, who just, ooh man, Lena Quigley in that era does things to me. Anyway, you know how it works is the cliche thing happens where the parents come back, the demon runs around and kills a bunch of kids, eventually gets to the Kelly's house, and all mayhem breaks loose, and I won't spoil the ending because I never do, and it's just a really cool plot, but it's just something that really requires a lot of overanalyzation, and when you watch it, I promise you it'll be easy to understand and you will have a blast with how much fun it is. You can sit back and observe. Welcome to my asylum of horrors. The doctor is in. One thing I gotta say that again is really special about this film is it feels like an 80s B flick and a 90s episode of Goosebumps came together and made a movie while still retaining all of the gratuitous nudity, gore, and cliches you expect out of a horror movie. It's something that you really have to see to believe and appreciate because it's just so damn cool. I mean, the mediocre acting, the everything. I had a scary dream. All dreams try to tell us things, even bad ones just makes this movie work together so well. And another thing that really makes the movie work together well is its somewhat unique storyline plot. We have these two families that have hated each other for generations upon generations, to the point where once upon a time, back in I guess the 1800s, one of them put a curse on the other and sent a monster out to go and kill them, and then in the end, someone made that whole affair of putting the crucifix in the ground to contain the monster. And of course, what comes along and removes the crucifix and makes the monster come back to life? The number one thing that always causes problems in this. No good partying teenagers. Paul, that is not funny! I mean, it's again, just everything you like and everything you gotta see. And what's really unique about the fact is that, well, I guess you could say it's unique because this is the third film where the main villain is coming after a young child to get him to do some sort of evil bidding or sacrifice.
Again, really one of those things where you're like, this is unique, but familiar. Another thing that you really gotta appreciate about these films is the mediocre acting. Sean. Uh, Sean. He's all right. Jim's a real safe biker. This almost makes me wonder if back in the day there was like an unwritten rule where the director just basically told everybody on set, do me a favor, don't take it too seriously. Have fun with it, look scared, look distressed, but have this element of it's serious but not serious. And I mean that in the best way possible, because as we all know, that's part of the experience of watching these films, and that's why I'm almost so damn curious, is this like an inside gag amongst people around that time? It's almost like the director and the screenwriter were informed it's 1985 instead of 1995 and just ran with it. I mean, fantastically well done. We do have some really cool cliches in here that we all know and love. The partying teenagers resurrecting the monster, of course, is one of them. Another one is, of course, the guy who doesn't give out any trick-or-treat candy getting killed. Learn how to play the guitar Miller's favorite style. I'm coming, little parasites. Trick-or-treat. Looking for a handout? Yes, sir. You have the guy who sets up the haunted house that's supposed to be harmless fun. <laughs> it's just one of those things that really, everything's there that needs to be there and it's tied together. And even though, like I said, it's a little bit on the midside, it's just a very polished thing altogether. And speaking of polished thing altogether, we need to talk about the fact that the main killer, Jacko, is fucking awesome looking. I said, the hell out of it. I mean, I'm a huge fan, in case you can't tell, of the whole jack o' lantern killer type of thing. But this is something really cool. This wasn't an off-the-shelf mask that they made. This is a huge prop that they have on top of this guy's head. And it even moves and has glowing lights behind it. Like it has facial expressions a little bit. Awesomely well done. And his kills are very, very cool. Maybe not the most creative, but we get a lot of good kill scenes out of this guy. And the whole execution of how they use him and how he's created. And the fact he pretty much looks like the headless horseman without his horse is just so damn cool. Because again... He looks like something that could be a Halloween costume, hence why no one is really taking him seriously until he's killed just about fucking everyone. Daniel Kelly led the mob that lynched Walter Mackey. That's terrible. Before the rope bit into his neck, Walter vowed revenge. He said the streets of Oakmore Crossing would run red with the blood of a... The one thing about this film that we need to remember is, first off, it is extremely fun to watch. I mean, this is one of those films that you know exactly what to expect when you watch it. The same way you know what to expect when you watch an alien film, the same way you know what to expect when you watch a Halloween film, assuming it's not one of those random offbeat ones that was a little too different for its own good. This is exactly what you expect to watch when you watch an 80s camp fest film, even though it's set in the 90s. You got the cliche me mediocre acting, you got the slasher villain running around killing people with no just cause. It's just a lot of fun to watch. And what's interesting is, like I said, it came out in the 90s, and it came out in 95, and that's when horror was in a little bit of a stagnant period, because the 80s just gave us icon after icon after icon. Your Freddies, your Jasons, your Hellraisers, your everything in there, pumpkin heads. This was just something else that was trying to just figure out what to do at the time because the genre was a little stale. Up until Scream came out the very next year in 1996 and really reinvented everything and made everything get super serious, this is kind of like part of that dying breath of slasher icons with cheesy acting and campy everything just so well done again. It's just a lot of fun if you know what to expect when you go and watch it. Something else that's really fascinating about this film is it's just the ultimate late 90s, 80s slasher flick that no one seems to know about. Again, this was during that stagnant era of horror, so that's probably why you can only watch this thing for like two bucks on Amazon, but it is two bucks well spent, especially if you gather a bunch of your friends around and eventually turn it into your seasonal watch that you should watch every season on Halloween, because I know I will be. And that's really my synopsis on this film. If you have seen this film, please comment down below how you felt about it and what your thoughts were on it. And if you think it's what I said it was, or if you're just like, yeah, man, this film is trash and they didn't really know what they were doing, I want to hear your opinion. And don't forget to stick around all month long for more episodes of Halloween 3 Into the Unknown where we review relatively unknown or completely unknown horror movies that take place on or around Halloween. And don't forget, 
like and subscribe to the channel, and thank you for watching. And remember, every Thursday night at 9 p.m. on twitch.tv backslash illtv4k, you can just catch me streaming on the Total Terrorathon Thursday. And then, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well, Saturday nights, you can catch me on the spooktacular Saturday night streams, where we're continuing onward with whatever horror game that I'm streaming at the time. But remember, after October 8th, it's officially time to start streaming Silent Hill 2, and I can't wait for that, because that game looks absolutely mortifying. And don't forget, one last thing. You're watching Ill TV, where if it's pop culture, you know it pops up here. <laughs> Happy Halloween on behalf of Ill TV, where if it's pop culture, you know it pops up here.